And now, please welcome the chorus of Biscayne Elementary School. And now, please welcome the chorus of Biscayne Elementary School.
All right. Good morning. Good morning. What a beautiful morning it is when we get to hear such beautiful and inspiring music by our very own children. You all, please give the Biscayne Elementary School Chorus under the direction of Ravinia Shaw and Principal Sana McBride another round of applause. Truly, just their beautiful faces and voices remind us of why we're all here today. In this pivotal moment, it really is important that we all rise up and rise to the occasion and really just demonstrate how much we're behind our young people and how eager we are to support them. My name is Rachel Tutwiler Fortune, and I serve as the president of the Jacksonville Public Education Fund. It is my honor to welcome you to Ed Talks 2021. If you've been to Ed Talks before, you know that Ed Talks really aims to inspire us all. But as I was reflecting on today, one of the things that I was reflecting upon is how this moment that we're all in right now, it requires inspiration and so much more. It actually also requires action. So throughout today's program, we're going to ask you to commit to acting upon what you hear. We're going to ask you to act as a partner, to act as a contributor. Act because you believe in the potential of our young people. If you know me, you know that this work is deeply personal to me. You see, I, like the students at Biscayne, attended and graduated from Duval County's public schools. I have a beautiful, almost 20 year old son now who graduated in the year 2020 amid the pandemic and I have a two and a half year old daughter who I proudly say is a rising Duval scholar. So as I think about what actions I want to take as we leave here today, it is going to be because of my belief in their potential and in the potential of all of our students. And I, join me, you, I invite you to join me in that quest. I want to start today's program by expressing deep and heartfelt gratitude, not only to those in the room, but also to the many who are joining us online. We appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. As I welcome you for what I know will be an inspiring time together, I want to thank some extraordinary people for their leadership and for their action, which makes it possible for us to be here together. I'll tell you a little bit about our mission at JPEF and I'll introduce you to our fabulous and talented MC. But first, would you please join me in thanking our esteemed board of directors at the Jacksonville Public Education Fund. I want to invite our board leaders to please stand. I thank them for their dedication to our mission and to our, our, our work to help close the opportunity gap. It's really unmatched how much they give in support of our mission, and we really appreciate how much they act on behalf of Duval County students. I also want to recognize the elected officials in the room. I'm going to start by recognizing City Councilwoman Brenda Priestley Jackson. Feel free to rise as I say your name. School Board Chair Liz Anderson. She's here already. School Board Vice Chair Daryl Willey. School Board Members Warren Jones. School Board Member Kelly Coker. And School Board Member Cindy Pearson. We're also joined by a few candidates for public office today. I want to appreciate them for taking the time to be with us as well. Um, we have candidate for City Council Tracy Paulson, as well as candidate for Sheriff Lakeisha Burton. for how you act to make our city and our schools better and stronger for our young people, we thank you. If there are any other public officials, I want to make sure I got everyone. Please stand at this time so I can make sure to recognize you. OK, I think I got everyone. Um, but we just really appreciate you for taking the time to be with us, and we thank you for your service to our community. We're able to host this event and engage in this work because of the generosity 
the action and the commitment of some outstanding community leaders. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart to all of our sponsors. They're listed in your program booklets, which should have been at your tables. Um, and I want to give special recognition first to our silver sponsors, starting with the Community Foundation for Northeast Florida, SSNC Technologies, Judge Brian Davis, and Terry and Lon Walton. Give them a hand. I want to thank now our gold sponsors, Reed USA, Poppy and Rob Clements, the Miller families, Cindy and Dan Edelman, CSX, and an anonymous sponsor in honor of James Baldwin. Please give them a hand. And last but most certainly not least, I want to thank our amazing speaker sponsor for this event, the Chartrand family. Give them a hand. And I would definitely be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to recognize Dr. Diana Green, our superintendent of schools. I see her right there. Would you please stand, Dr. Green? <laughs> For those of us who are lucky to work with Dr. Green, we know her to be bold, action-oriented, and a capable leader, even before the pandemic. But I tell you that during the past year and a half, all leaders have been tested, but Dr. Green has proven to be a beacon of light, guiding our schools through these uncertain times. And we're so grateful for her leadership. Um, I, I said this at a Teacher of the Year event earlier this week, but I told her we're gonna milk this as long as we can. We're so proud also that she is Florida's 2020 Superintendent of the Year. So we appreciate her leadership. Joining us today are also many leaders and educators who work in and in support of our traditional and public charter schools every day. I want to ask you all to please raise your hands. If you're looking around the room, you see them. Thank you all so much for how you act in service of every school, every classroom, for every student, every single day. Supporting you and investing in your ability to effectively reach our young people and prepare them for citizenship and their futures is the reason we are all here. And now to tell you just a little bit about JPEF. Today's event comes even as the mission of JPEF has never been more important from my perspective. We're an independent think and do tank. We work tirelessly to help close the opportunity gap for low income students and students of color in Duval County. In the last decade, Duval County's public schools have made significant progress. Our graduation rate is over 90% at present. That's definitely worth a round of applause. But we also know that disparities persist. And we also know that each and every child is 100% capable of maximizing their potential. And we will continue to act in service of our mission until that potential is realized. Our world is changing, and public schools are the key to preparing young people for success in a world with both threats and opportunities that are globalized. This pandemic has revealed such significant gaps in the lives of so many children, and we believe that we must redouble our efforts to reach the most vulnerable. So how will we do it? Where do we go from here? As always, JPEF is here to be a research-led convener to help guide our community and our schools towards the most promising practices for our children. Today, right here, the Jacksonville Public Education Fund is inviting you into the next chapter of our impact in schools. Later in the program, we will share with you an exciting new goal that the community has embraced to recruit and retain diverse male teachers in our schools, strengthening our educator pipeline. I'm incredibly proud of the collaboration with DCPS, UNF, philanthropists, researchers, community leaders, and teachers themselves that has led to this goal. We have been working for months to prepare for this moment, and we're so excited to share it with you. 
I would be remiss if I didn't especially thank Dory and Bill Walton for their generous support of our research and planning around this priority, as it truly made this work possible. Following our event today, we're bringing many partners together during what we call Ed Talks Plus Action to begin and deepen the work today. And as we do, I ask you to take a moment to make sure you turn to the page in your program booklet that contains the agenda as it has information about how you can text to give to support these efforts. I hope you'll join me in these vitally important efforts at a vitally important time to do so. But first, I invite you to take a look with me and learn just a little bit more about the work of the Jacksonville Public Education Fund. A great education system is vital to Jacksonville. Without a great school system, we will never be a great city. At the time, the graduation rates in the community were uh, abysmal, and it was very clear that there was a group of students who were not thriving in the system, who were not growing in the system. At that time, it was really interesting. 80% of the people in this community had no connection whatsoever to public schools, which is pretty shocking if you think about it. So only 20% either had a child in the system or worked for the district. So we wanted to be able to engage parents and community groups. We really needed a constant voice for public education innovation and reform in Duval County. JPEF's biggest impact is it has been a successful public-private partnership, something that we were hoping for. Having a collected, organized voice about the issues that affect the children of our community, I think has probably been its largest impact. So we've made tremendous progress, yet we are concerned that we still have significant opportunity gap between uh, low-income students, students of color, and their peers. And so our focus moving forward has to be to close those gaps. Public education is the one institution that tries to level the playing field. Our goal is to ensure that no matter what zip code our students live in, they can receive a high quality education. High performing schools have high performing leaders. Putting the emphasis and the energy and the attention through strong leadership in those schools that need it most just seems to make sense. And to be a leader of a Title I school, you have to develop strategies to support these students that are living in environments that may not be positive. We want to be great in education in Duval County. We have dedicated teachers, we have dedicated principals. Ideas and new ways of doing things is what JPEF brings to the table and which will differentiate Jacksonville. I'm excited for JPEF to deepen its impact on public education in our city. It's going to make Jacksonville a better place, a thriving community that supports all young people to be successful in their lives. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our MC for today, Deborah Hicks Quazo. Many of you already know Deborah for her business acumen and commitment to our city. She currently serves as managing partner of GSB Ventures, the venture capital fund that invests in exceptional entrepreneurs and companies in the education technology sector. Her commitment to giving back is simply stellar as she serves on numerous boards of directors and has been uh, the recipient of countless awards. We were honored to have Deborah join us for our last two Ed Talks and we are so grateful and thrilled that she took time out of her busy schedule to join us today. Deborah, I invite you to take it away, and honored guests, if you haven't already, please enjoy your lunch and consider how you can take part in the much needed action that will follow today. Thank you. Um, terrific, thank you so much, Rachel, and uh, another congratulations to Dr. Green. I'm blessed to know a number of superintendents here in Florida 
and it is an elite national group of people, and so to be the Superintendent of the Year is truly um, an incredible honor. Uh, I want to thank everyone. I want to remind everybody to wear their, wear their masks and, and do proper, all the proper protocols. Um, and I want to thank everyone for coming to support the work of JPEF. JPEF is investing, as we have seen already, in innovations that will move the needle for vulnerable students here in Duval County. And, and we're delighted you're here to learn more about the work that's being done together to improve Duval County schools, and particularly this initiative for a thousand diverse um, men, of, men in this, the teacher corps. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who you've seen a little bit of on the video previously, a community leader who really needs no introduction to most of you here in the audience today. Judge Brian Davis is a former prosecutor and civil litigator who currently serves as a U.S. District Judge for the Middle District of Florida. He's a native of Jacksonville and a graduate of its public schools, and he attended Princeton University, like I did, which is cool, and where today's distinguished speaker, Eddie Gloud, um, serves as well as, um, as well. He went to the University of Florida Law School, and Judge Davis has actively volunteered with so many community groups that it would take practically all afternoon to list them, but I'll try. He's with Leadership Jacksonville, NCCJ, the Urban League, the NAACP, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity, Jacksonville Community Council, Hubbard House, the Help Center, the Pace Center for Girls, the Jaguars Foundation, and One Jacks, and yes, there's more, He's also the chair of the board of JPEF, the Jacksonville Public Education Fund. He is the next chair of the board of directors of the Community Foundation for Northeast Florida. So please, let's all welcome to the stage Judge Brian Davis. Thank you, Deborah. Please allow me to shift your focus. We each and every one of us here today is here to improve the chances that all of our children can have productive and rewarding lives. We give of our time through the volunteers who are the transmission of our work. We give of our talent, the engine that drives our innovation, and we give of our treasure, the fuel for our leadership. Please know that each and every one of you is appreciated for your support of the Jacksonville Public Education Fund. I also want to extend a special note of appreciation from each of you and the JPEF board to the Chartran family who is responsible for our Ed Talk speaker's presence here today. Thank you. In October of 2019, I had the pleasure of joining over 3,000 African American alumni of Princeton University on campus for a weekend reunion. In addition to the partying, there were workshops and lectures for our sober consideration. It was there that I first met our speaker. He enthralled several hundred of us in McCosh Hall by reading from a manuscript of a yet published book which is now yours to learn from. In the fall of 2020, as soon as it was published, I purchased my copy. So I apologize, Dr. Glaude, if when I ask you to sign it, you find it filled with cigar ash and beach sand. <laughs> As I digested the work, it occurred to me that my campus experience and this nonfiction book embodied some of JPEF's work. Here I was, an Afri here was an African-American professor wholly absent when I was there 40 years ago, along with Bill and Dory Walton. Actually, it wasn't quite that long for Dory, and I probably needed to say that for the record. <laughs> but, but here was an African-American professor now teaching, no, I said enthralling, African-American learners, and in addition to challenging their intellect, causing some of them, including to me, to have the idea you know, 
maybe one day I can be a professor. In pursuing Dr. Gloud's biography, or perusing it, I was struck by the kinds of things he's prepared to talk about and thought it, that a sample of those would provide a window into his dynamic intellect. Here they are. Lessons from the late Dr. King. What's your DEI moonshot? The ethics of anti-racism. Race and democracy. America is always changing, but America never changes. Breaking news, Dr. Eddie Gloud Jr. on democracy in the news. And the paradox of education for black and brown children. The framework for that kind of thinking derives from Professor Gloud entering Dr. Martin Luther King's alma mater, Morehouse, at the age of 16, from which he graduated to earn a master's degree at Temple University and a PhD degree from Princeton University. Dr. Gloud is the James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor and Chair of the Department of African American Studies at Princeton. He frequently appears in the media as a col and as a columnist for Time Magazine and an in, in SNBC contributor on programs like Morning Joe and Deadline White House. He regularly appears on Meet the Press on Sundays. He is recognized as one of the nation's most prominent scholars, authors, political commentators, public intellectuals, and passionate educators. I have been so pleased to learn that the New York Times bestseller, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America, and the Urgent Lessons for Our Own, which you now each own, thanks to Read USA, has had such a wide reading as evidenced by the popularity of a James Baldwin quotation referenced in Dr. Gloud's work. Quote, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced, close quote. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me as he helps JPEF and our community face things that need to be changed in Jacksonville's providing of public education to its children by warmly welcoming our speaker of the afternoon, Dr. Eddie S. Gloud, Jr. I promise you, this is not a Princeton conspiracy. I promise you. I promise you. Thank you, uh, Judge Davis, for that gracious uh, introduction. I remember that Thrive event. Can you hear me? I remember that Thrive event. It was wonderful. Uh, it was an attempt to shock Princeton at its core, you know? Princeton, that Southern Ivy, with 3,000 of its African-American alums walking around campus. It was a wonderful experience. Um, Sister Deborah, thank you uh, for uh, convening us, getting us going. I want to thank uh, Sister Rachel for uh, her leadership. Where is she? Thank you, Rachel. Uh, we've been meeting over Zoom for a while now, for pre preparing for this day. Uh, where's that amazing superintendent? There she is, right over there. I want to lift her up. <laughs> Sister Ellen, thank you for all your work. Thank you for giving everyone a copy of this book. I'm going to tell my editor. Uh, he will be happy. I appreciate you. And Brother Jeff, thank you for making this moment possible for me to come and share some thoughts. Now, I, I know I only have a little bit of time, and as uh, the preacher that I often pretend to be, I'm going to take a lot of it. No, I'm going to keep us on schedule. We find ourselves, and there is no reasonable way to deny this, in a moment of profound transition. America is changing, and the substance of that transformation is not quite clear, at least to me it isn't who we will be as a nation 
has yet to come into view. And we see those among us who clamor for the good old days as they confront the political and cultural implications of demographic shifts. They long for an America that looks and feels a certain way. This nostalgia, alongside the intimacy and intensity of our hatreds and unbridled greed, has brought the nation to its knees. The divisions within this country, white and black, rural and urban, rich, poor, Republican, Democrat, are all in full view now. It feels, if we're honest, as if the institutions and norms of our democracy are collapsing right in front of our bloodshot eyes. We are changing. But as James Baldwin put it, the, uh, the horror, quote, is that America changes all the time without ever changing at all, end quote. You know, I came across this story as I was preparing for uh, this talk, and I know I only have 30 minutes. I'm going to take 35, right? I came across this story while reading about the revolutionary period in our country's history. On December 14, 1763, the Paxton Volunteers in the back country of Pennsylvania attacked a Conestoga village. They murdered native men, women, and children, burned their cabins to the ground. The volunteers claimed that the Susquehannocks, who had long ties with the surrounding community, were in fact secret enemies, French allied, and were poised to slaughter whites. Governor John Penn at the time got word of the actions of his fellow white Pennsylvanians. He called for the perpetrators to be captured and charged with murder. But instead of them being captured, the volunteers hunted down the native peoples who escaped and fled to Lancaster, and they slaughtered them. Some of their fellows tried to justify the actions of the men, said they were young and inflamed with passion. But to protect the native peoples, the Pennsylvania government relocated them to Philadelphia and put them in a military barracks guarded by British regulars for safety. Hmm? Now this act, the act of the Pennsylvania government at the time in 1763, led the volunteers to conclude that, quote, their government did not protect their safety and liberty the safety and liberty of its own people, but enforced dangerous allegiances with savages who would unleash horrors against backcountry settlers." End quote. So 250 or so black, 250 or so men decided to march to Philadelphia to confront the government. Ben Franklin, yes, Ben Franklin was dispatched to meet them. And when Franklin arrived, the men handed him a petition that claimed the government had ignored their concerns. The men didn't express regret or guilt for their actions. Their friends and family, others, defended them. One pamphlet entitled The Conduct of the Paxton Men, impartially represented, suggested that the men had in fact lost their minds, but their madness, their madness had been driven by the government's good treatment of heathens and traitors. They insisted, these mad men, the back country of Pennsylvania, they insisted that their liberty and their lives mattered more than others. Before we were a country, men mad with the fever of liberty and the belief that their lives mattered more than others threatened to pull apart the very fabric of our society. And we see in this story the intimacy of our hatreds, not only towards those who live among them, who lived among them, traded with them, with whom they had long-lasting friendships, but the intimacy of those who felt kinship with the murderers, who loved them and defended them, no matter their monstrous actions. And here we are today. The fever still holds. 
We saw it on January 6th when a mob of mostly white men and women sacked the people's house shouting, stop the steal. We see it in the ongoing efforts to delegitimize de our democracy by sowing distrust in electoral processes and officials. We see it in legislative efforts to enable the rejection of election outcomes that some may disagree with. All of which, in my view, reveals a panic about the changing nature of our country a distorted view of liberty that sanctions violence and this belief that some among us, because of the color of their skin, ought to be valued more, that these people have a different sense of possession of this place, while the rest of us should shut up and be grateful. These ideas are as old as the republic. They, these ideas, food for the serpents that have threatened to swallow this fragile experiment whole. And any sincere grappling with who we will become as a nation, any sincere grappling with your charge, must confront this serpent in the garden. The fundamental contradiction that has this nation by the throat, I believe, rests with a certain valuation of human beings. What I've called elsewhere the value gap is at the heart of our troubles. This valuation says, and it is instantiated in our social, political, and economic arrangements, that white people matter more than others and distributes advantage and disadvantage accordingly. The value gap is not simply the possession of loud racist, however. That's too easy. It is maintained in the habitual ways in which we live our lives. You know, we learn it in how our neighborhoods are constituted, how our cities and towns are organized. We learn it at work, in our schools, at our universities and colleges. Racial habits sustain the value gap. Habits, broadly speaking, involve the stuff we inherit that help us move around the world, move about our worlds, you know, social systems, stories, beliefs, myths, ideas of virtue or moral excellences, or vices or moral failings. Racial habits, then, should be understood as a particular kind of social habit that sets the stage for our living. We come to virtuous behavior, then, not by some heroic act of the will alone, but in the context of social arrangements that habituate and convict us to act in accordance to what is considered virtuous. Who we are is deeply bound up with the place we initially find our footing. So racial habits, again, sustain the value gap, and they block the way to the kinds of dispositions needed for democratic life. Y'all didn't know y'all were going to be in a lecture today, did you? <laughs> the kinds, they block the way to the formulation of the kinds of dispositions requisite for democracy. Now, those of you who, who would attend my philosophy classes, you must understand that habit talk is key to character formation. Aristotle talks about it but I'm showing out right now, I'll get back to my text. <laughs> now I bring up all of this habit talk for a reason. Habits are, as I said, key to character formation. Typically, bad habits are indications of bad people. And any attempt to address issues of racial injustice or racial equity must involve the question of who do we aspire to be. It calls forward the question of character formation. One can make the argument, for example, that the institution of slavery deformed and distorted American democracy. Abraham Lincoln said as much. He condemned slavery as a monstrous injustice. Lincoln also believed in the value gap. I'm trying to get somewhere. Walk with me, right? He also believed in the value gap. He held noxious views about black people's capacities and certainly did not view them, did not view us as equal to whites. Think about Lincoln's speech in response to the Dred Scott decision in 1857 and his response to those who accused him of supporting interracial marriage. Quote, there was a natural disgust in the minds of nearly all white people to the idea of the indiscriminate amalgamation of the black and the white, end quote. 
Or July 17, 1858, when a speech he delivered in Springfield, quote, what I would most desire would be the separation of the white and black races, end quote. For Lincoln, slavery was a moral, social, and political evil that deformed and distorted American democracy. But white racism was a natural consequence of the obvious superiority of white people to others. Like Lincoln, I believe the evil of slavery deformed. American democracy. But I want to insist that the value gap, this belief that some people, because of the color of their skin, ought to be valued more than others, the value gap deform and distorts the characters of those who embrace it, blocking the way for the development of the kinds of people our democracies require. On April 14, 1876, at the unveiling of the Freedmen's Monument in Lincoln Park, Washington, D.C., Frederick Douglass delivered his oration in memory of Abraham Lincoln. I was struck by a particular passage, quote, it must be admitted, truth compels me to admit, even here in the presence of the monument erected in his memory, Abraham Lincoln was not in the fullest sense of the word either our man or our model in his interest, in his associations, in his habits of thought, and in his prejudices, he was a white man. He, first and last, you and yours were the objects of his deepest affection and his most earnest solicitude. You are the children of Abraham Lincoln. We are at best his stepchildren, children by adoption, children by forces of circumstance and necessity, end quote. Douglas acknowledges the exalted place of Lincoln in the history of the nation, but makes explicit the limits of his character, that Lincoln's commitment to the belief that white people mattered more than others distorted his moral vision and blocked the way to the kinds of excellences Lincoln's own ideal of democracy called for. To put it shortly or succinctly, Lincoln couldn't be the kind of man his conception of democracy required. This belief that white people matter more rests at the heart of this nation and confounds us at every turn, exposing the limits of our capacity for generosity, our sense of humility, our ideas of benevolence and mutuality, and revealing the limits of our idea of justice. Here we are in 2021, still struggling with the service. We must admit, and if we don't, we do so at our peril, that racial inequality in this country is not the result of random events. Ours is the country we have made. Racial inequality is not the result of a collection of bad choices on the part of various individuals. Of course, they're knuckleheads. We all have knuckleheads. Right? It is the consequence of policy decisions, of deliberate efforts to build a society that instantiates the value gap. So all we need to do is think about the policies of the New Deal, that moment that created the vaunted American middle class, black folks systematically locked out by Southern Democrats. Think about the benefits of the GI Bill, black veterans who risked their lives overseas for freedom, locked out because of the systemic racism that denied them access to benefits. A dual housing market, a dual labor market, residential segregation, banking policy, segregated schools. Think about American public education. Who has access to what? Most states fund our schools with property taxes. And we know that residential segregation and banking policies impact the resources available to those schools, to those babies. In reality, we have never committed ourselves to educating all of our children. And the question we have to ask ourselves is why? Honestly, racial inequality isn't the result of random events. It is the consequence of deliberate, cho deliberate choices with accumulated benefit over time. And if I'm right, and historical evidence suggests that I am, the only way we are going to remedy racial inequality is to admit that we created it and be just as deliberate in trying to get rid of it.
we will have to commit ourselves to building a country that affirms the dignity and sacrality of every human being. And that will involve, I think it must involve, guaranteeing the best education for every child in this country, in this county, no matter the color of their skin, their zip code, their gender, or their ability. It will involve finally uprooting the idea that some among us ought to be valued more than others. Now this is hard work. I got 10 minutes. Do it. Y'all tell me if I'm going on too long now. I'm going to try to earn my money, Jeff. <laughs> now, this is hard work. We have to tell ourselves the truth about what we've done and who we are. Stories are critical to character formation. That truth or better acceptance becomes the basis for a different way of being together. But it is hard to tell ourselves the truth about who we are in this country. We would rather affirm our goodness, titillated by markets, affirmed through consumption, guided by image, moved about by pornographic algorithms of desire. The illusion of safety and comfort is found there, but in doing so, we remain permanently docked at the station, doing the same thing over and over again. Wash, rinse, and repeat. I'm reminded of Eugene O'Neill's No Chance Saloon. I can't taste my liquor hickey. Hmm? We tell ourselves that our institutions do not bear the markings of racism to absolve ourselves of our sins. To maintain a kind of innocence, we tell ourselves the lie about who we are because we don't want to admit what we've done and what is required of us to repair it all. But if we're going to come through this moment really transformed, if we are finally to get out of history's ass pocket, and become the kinds of people democracies require, we're going to have to uproot the value gap and the racial habits that sustain it. To do that, we're going to have to tell ourselves the truth, Rachel. As James Baldwin put it in The Fire Next Time, it is not permissible that the authors of devastation should also be innocent. It is the innocence that constitutes the crime. This country is not an example of democracy achieved. We're not the shining city on the hill, but that's okay. To admit that doesn't condemn us to hell. It doesn't make us irredeemable. In fact, the admission is the condition of our growing up. We tell ourselves these stories in order to protect ourselves from what we've done. So our problem, I, to my mind, our problems in the United States go beyond who occupies the White House or the latest act or instance of American racism, we have to get to the rot at the heart of the matter. Tap the root. We are trapped in a history we refuse to know but carry within us, especially in the South. The terrors and panic we experience today have everything to do with the gap between who we imagine ourselves to be and who deep down we really are. And that the nation actively evades confronting this gap locks the country into a kind of perpetual adolescence where those who desperately hold on to the American myth as a new world Eden refuse to grow up. But imagine being stuck forever in Never Never Land, refusing to take on responsibility and refusing to be held to account. We have to be better. And investing in educating all of our children is a great place to begin that work on ourselves. Investing by investing in all of our babies. Every American wants for his or her child to dream the grandest dreams. But for far too long, some children don't dare to dream dreams. Such hubris would immediately place them in danger because the world is arrayed against them. They wake up and see it every day. They feel it in their bones as the society says to them over and over again that you are less than, even though they sing, we'll rise up. Hmm? Society says to them every, every day that you are less than, disregards their dreams and aspirations and seeks to confine them to the shadows. And when they enter our schools, all too often, this dark vision of the world is reaffirmed. In October of, October of 1963, y'all all right? We started five minutes late, so I got five minutes, Rachel. <laughs> I was going to catch this up, but I changed my mind. In October of 1963, James Baldwin published in the Saturday, Saturday Review, The Negro Child, His Self-Image. 
Like our own times, Baldwin acknowledged that he was living in a very dangerous time, he said. And he took up the question of education as a kind of preliminary exploration of the tension between the aim of education to socialize our children in ways of our society and to equip them with the tools to critically assess our society. And Baldwin wrote, the purpose of education is to create in a person the ability to look at the world for himself, to, to make his own decisions, to say to himself, this is black and this is white, or to decide for himself whether there is God or in heaven or not, to ask questions of the universe. And then to learn to live with those questions is the way he achieves or she achieves his own identity. But no society is really anxious to have that kind of person around. Black and brown children, Baldwin suggests, experience a certain kind of dissonance in this regard. They grow up in a society which denies them dignity and standing, where a generalized sense of disregard characterizes the society's view of them. And to develop a critical stance towards this society and its views of black and brown people is to risk one's life. What is asked and demanded is a kind of consent to a host of assumptions about who you are and to the structures that give those assumptions life. You are to know your place. Think about, how we, think about how we regiment black children. You go to a Montessori school, the children are going everywhere. Go to a friend's school, what do you see? Our children. Why? We need to socialize you how to navigate these spaces. We have to discipline you so that you know that you're not free. Oh, y'all didn't hear me. <laughs> As Baldwin put it, it becomes thoroughly clear, at least to me, that any Negro who is born in this country and undergo undergoes the American educational system runs the risk of becoming schizophrenic. On the one hand, he's born in the shadow of the stars and stripes, and he's assured it represents a nation which has never lost a war. But on the other hand, he's also assured by his country and his countrymen that he has never contributed anything to civilization that his past is nothing more than a record of humiliations gladly endured. And it is against this reality, Baldwin says, in full light of forces aimed at reproducing hierarchies for exploitation, that the black and brown child must forge herself in a world that devalues her. She has to imagine herself as something more. I'm a country boy from Moss Point, Mississippi. My mother had her first baby in the ninth grade. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm an object supposedly of your philanthropy, an object of charity. But I had to figure out through the help of community how to dream expansive dreams and to understand that I put myself at risk to do so. child must find the means to say no to society that every turn seeks to condemn her to a certain station in life. And for Baldwin, through his autobiographical example, to refuse this sentence amounts to an extraordinary act of the will. I'm thinking about my principal, Miss Polk, who put a crown above my head. He said, boy, you can run your mouth a lot. You smart. Thinking about my coaches, who saw that even though I thought I could play in the Major League Baseball, in Major League Baseball, that really I had a brain who insisted that I think my way through the games. I'm thinking about Dr. Aaron Parker at Morehouse, who asked me one time, when are you going to get your life out of the garbage can? And I wanted to be like him. I wanted to be a philosophy professor. He was my first black male teacher. They had faith in me. And they gave me license to imagine myself in the most expansive of terms. This frightened little Mississippi boy who wanted to say something to the world. One decides. And Baldwin doesn't give us much by way of how this happens, but the child decides. One decides to say no to it all, to refuse the categorization, and at that point to enter into battle against society's understanding of you. It's 
paradox of education. When you begin to develop a conscience, Baldwin says you must find yourself at war with the society that seeks to confine you. We must advocate for a view of education for all of our children that rid us of this paradox. Our babies can't be swimming upstream in your schools. They have to be confirmed in their dreams. <laughs> the pursuit of a more racially just society, in the end, shouldn't make us more uncomfortable or unsettled. Rather than charity, our efforts should reflect a commitment to, set, to a set of just arrangements that affords every person a chance, every child a chance, to not only dream dreams, but to make her dreams a reality. And we do so with full acknowledgement of what we have done to deny opportunities to certain groups because of our longstanding commitment to the value gap. In order for this to happen, we will have to admit that the trouble is deeper than we wish to think because the trouble is in us. We are the serpents in the garden, too. We are. As a nation today, we stand on a knife's edge. I'm coming to a close. Some of y'all know what that means. We stand on a knife's edge. The background conditions of American democracy have cracked. Pandemic has, re has revealed so much about what's wrong with our society. The virus has changed us, or perhaps more accurately, revealed who we are. So we have to dare to be otherwise. How do we step up? What must we do differently in this moment? What will be your moonshot? One time I asked Cornell West, who was my dissertation advisor, Right, a silly question. It was so corny, I'm embarrassed to tell you about it. I said, how does one become great? We were in his Cadillac, too, and he was smoking his cigar pipe at the time. And he looks at me and he says, uh, brother, sometimes you shoot for the stars and you land on the moon or your ass. <laughs> but shoot for the stars. What's your moonshot? Don't tinker around the edges. What does it mean to educate all of our children? What does it mean to be invested in the future of this democracy? Well, it's going to be hard work, but tell yourselves the truth. Uproot the value gap in everything you do. Understand that this distorted view of liberty that goes back to before we were a country threatens the very foundation of the republic. Go back and understand that this belief that some people matter because of the color of their skin, some people are valued more than others because of the color of their skin, that that threatens not only the republic, but you. It distorts who you are. Shoot for the stars. Place a crown above every baby's head. And who knows, we might get it right this time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Gloud, for inspiring and challenging us, but mostly for making us realize that we have within us the power to change the world we want to see. So thank you. Thank you. Very hopeful. I don't know. Was it mean to be placed after Dr. Gloud? <laughs> So it takes courage and investments to create an equity moonshot. 
and we have the biggest hearts and minds in this room to do it. So keep investments in your mind, but first let me tell you, uh, Dr. Gloud is going to uh, be involved in a fireside chat in a few moments, and we want to hear from you. So please uh, look for the little yellow index cards on your table and put your questions in and hand to a JPEF staff member that will be walking around. Um, and for those of you joining us virtually, we want to hear from you too. So please put your questions in the questions section in the live stream. All right. So I'm so glad you all have received a copy of Dr. Gloud's deeply moving book, Begin Again. Read USA was thrilled to invest in them for you. And I know it's worth your investment to read and share the message all around. Thank you for calling me sister, too. That's going to carry me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Ellen Wiss, and I am honored to be the co-chair of this event with one of my favorite people in the entire universe, uh, the one and only Jeffrey Chartrand. whose investment today brought Dr. Gloud here. So deep bow to you, my friend. I can learn that from you. <laughs> um, I'm also a proud member of the JPEF Board of Directors and the founder of Read USA. I am thrilled to both be an ambassador for uh, JPEF as well as a partner through Read USA in the incredible work that JPEF is leading in our local campaign for grade level reading, as well as the focus on uh, teacher diversity and building a diverse teacher pipeline. When Read USA launched our one-to-one -one reading tutoring program that pairs up high school scholars, almost all of whom identify as persons of color, from the same under-resourced communities as the uh, elementary school students they are trained to teach, we consulted with JPEF for guidance and practices, or, or for best practices, uh, to measure and achieve our goals. These are teens experiencing their own transformational impact on a child. And from that experience, many of them are choosing to, they're choosing education as their career. That's a powerful pipeline. Making the investment up front to create a plan that works was well worth it for us, and we are so grateful to JPEF as our partner in that role. So you don't have to go any further than right here to learn what is working in our community and what is worth your investment. Reading unlocks so many opportunities for children. Once a child learns to read, he or she can do anything, go anywhere. And it takes a diverse group of teachers and tutors to help a child cross over from reading to learn to le or learning to read to reading to learn. Then there's a level playing field. Then the magic happens. Frederick Douglass said, once you learn to read, you will forever be free. Well, freedom takes investments. Can anyone guess why I'm up here? <laughs> OK, thanks. Uh, you're right. Um, it's time to rise up, and it's time to take our shots. Hockey great Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Let's not one of us in this room miss our shot today, OK? All right. Now please think of a child that you care very much about, one that you wish to have all the opportunities that this world has to offer and hold that child in your mind. We have a fundraising goal today. Uh, 
And this is gonna be so easy for you because you are investing in what works. Together, we are gonna help level the playing field and give all kids a shot. So get ready, pull out your phones and credit cards. And that goes for our friends watching virtually because we need all of you. And while you're doing that, as Dr. Gloud has inspired us, it is time for Duval County's Equity Moonshot. So please turn your attention to the videos and watch some truly amazing leaders and teachers, or educators. Duval County Public Schools demographic is that 43% of our students are African American, yet our teaching force has less than 3% African American males uh, as educators. Our students are receiving a high quality education even though the demographics aren't exactly matching up, but how much more powerful would it be to to increase our minority male teachers in the classroom, supporting a very diverse population. Diverse male teachers in the classroom um, really create a sense of connection for our students. And to really elevate our students to the level that they need to be, we have to create as many connections as possible for our students to see someone like them in front of the classroom. When a student can see that, they know that we care, that they have a voice, that they matter. This particular initiative is building on all the efforts that have come before it. Evidence and data that we've collected over time supports the fact that a more diverse teaching force is linked to improvements in graduation. We're really working to bring the right partners with the right goals and the right plan together to focus on how we can develop the diverse teacher pipeline that we need for Jacksonville's future. So at the University of North Florida, recently we completed an economic impact study uh, that really looked deeply at what would happen if we hired and diversified our, our pipeline of teachers in, in the region. For every scholarship that we offered a student from underrepresented groups, the return on investment was over a million dollars. This benefits everyone. The responsibility of UNF's College of Education and Human Services is to prepare the educators for tomorrow, right? And we want to make sure we diversify that teacher education pipeline because it's beneficial to all students and all families. And we plan on partnering with JPEF to do the same things with minority males who are considering education as a career. As an African-American male, I didn't see an African-American male or teacher in my life until I got to high school. And also, I'm an educator. So as I was in the classroom, I got to experience it firsthand. I got to experience that connection, that additional connection that I had with our young people. I go to Springfield Middle. So my dad, he's a PE coach at YMWA. And he has students who go there that kind of went through the same thing he went through as a kid. Like, going, growing up in neighborhoods that didn't have the best things for his future. And he really wants the students to stay out of trouble, you know, just keep their heads in the books and make it out. It kind of gives me a bit of inspiration for the future. Like, okay, there are people that look like me that can do these things. So it gives me hope for the future. Um, I want to be president.
You heard it here first. This is, this is such an exciting moment. We have the opportunity to help make this happen in our community. Now it's time for us to take our shots. I'm going to do it too. Okay, so all you have to do, so wait a minute, you got that child held in your mind? <laughs> um, okay, I'm thinking of Jordan too. He wants to be president. Let's give him that shot. Yeah. Since you have your phones ready, all you have to do is text JPEF, your name, no, I'm sorry, the amount, and your name to 50155. So I'm going to do it too. I'm not throwing away my shot. I'm not throwing away my shot. I miss Hamilton. 50155. JPEF. My name. Okay. Are there others coming in? I hope I let. Oh, look at that. Over 53% of the goal. Yay. Let's keep going. Let's invest in what works. Like Dr. Gloud said, or I think he said something about either go big or go home. So let's, uh, let's go big before we go home. Keep that child in your mind. You know, Maya Angelou uh, and Anne Frank both said, no one ever became poor by giving. So don't throw away your shot. Do not throw away your shot. Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. And the sooner you give, the sooner I get off this stage. <laughs> okay, keep holding that child in your mind and take your shot. Give all kids a shot. Like Nike says, just do it. So, all right, I'm going to hand it off to Deborah now, uh, but keep those pledges and gifts coming in because we're going to check in after the fireside chat to see how we're doing. And thank you for your investments in what works and for giving all the kids in our community the shot they deserve. Ellen, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Glau, I'll get you back up here. Dr. Gloud, I have to, I have to, I'm cold calling you. You have to, <laughs> I have to come back up. All right, that was fantastic. Overhit the, uh, the goal, which is spectacular. Um, as advertised, we are going a little long, so we may, may be limited, depending on the direction I get from Rachel, on how many questions we can ask. It was your fault, totally. Um, but I did see that you gave the moonshot, which I totally appreciate and we're so grateful for. Um, so I want to start with that. I mean, I think you got the picture on the moonshot here for JPEF. You told your story of not having seen a black instructor until you got to Morehouse. How important do you think this objective of diversifying the teacher core is for us and for the country? And importantly, how do we encourage young people back you know, into the teacher core, particularly coming out of COVID? It, it was absolutely critical for me. I had black uh, women who taught me. But uh, you know, all of the male teachers, they weren't teachers, they were athletic coaches. Um, I didn't encounter a black male professor until I went to Morehouse at 16. And it was that experience that led me to see myself in different terms. I wanted to do that. You know, I had watched Dead Poets Society. You remember Robin Williams and the way he taught in that? And I was like, ooh, that's exciting. And then I had a professor who actually was almost like that in terms of his enthusiasm for me. So it's critical. It's not just simply seeing someone. It's someone who, who values you, who sees something in you um, that's as important. Um, it's, it's a challenge because we know that black boys are, they experience difficulties early on. Uh, so we have to be much more deliberate in how we go about doing it. So is it really, 
part of the impediment the fact that black boys may be having bad experiences in school, so the idea of being attracted back to being a teacher in that school is creates quite, you know, quite high friction? So on the one hand, there are pipeline questions, which, and we can begin to unpack what that looks like and why it's an issue. On the other hand, they're, they're, it's also where we're looking. Right? I mean, y'all have FAMU, you have Bethune Cook, I mean, there are a number of, Morehouse, there are a number of places that you can actually recruit uh, to find um, uh, black uh, uh, men, or you can have his, you know, historic colleges that are that educate native peoples and and Hispanic or Latino Latinx folk. We just have to be very deliberate in how we go about doing it. And this is echoing something I said in my talk, right? We have to be as deliberate in getting rid of it, getting rid of the inequality as we were in creating it, and that that's going to require some out, outside of the box thinking. Completely, and I'm quite optimistic about the attention and elevation HBCUs across the country are getting at this moment, um, which is, I think, unprecedented. I mean, yeah. Morehouse is spectacular and always has been, but I think you're seeing a... Yeah, I, just, I, was just, um, in, I'm, I was just invited to be on the board of Morehouse College, the board of trustees of Morehouse College, and, and I'm excited about because they tried to kick me out like three times <laughs> while, I was, <laughs> while I was there. It was fascinating. But uh, we have seen an uptick uh, in applications, historic uptick in applications to HBCUs, but HBCUs are historically underfunded. Correct. And so the resources available to, to respond to that demand uh, has to increase as well. Totally agree. Rachel, do we want to, I can't, I can't see any. Do we have questions? I, I don't want to run out of time to let the audience ask, okay? Because I know you have. I'm sorry, guys. That's what happens when you run your mouth too yeah. long. But we yeah. started with my, am I being fair? We started late with me, right? Okay. I went about 35, 40 minutes. Yeah. You know, I, it depends on how, how disciplined everybody wants me to be. I, I'm easy. Um, to realize the vision you've described, should, should we focus more on changing hearts and minds or changing policy? Time and resources are not unlimited, so where would you encourage us to place more emphasis? Right. I think we have a finite amount of civic energy. And so the way to do this is policy and hearts and minds will follow. I mean, I always use this example when, you know, when, sorry to go pol political for a quick second, but when Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980, many of us remember, some folk were like, oh my God, we're gonna have World War III, right? Some people even said, George H.W. Bush said, this is voodoo economics. And Ronald Reagan did not spend his energy trying to convince Democrats to accept his vision. They just simply Im implemented it and changed the center of gravity of American politics for 40 years. Picked up the ball from the FDR field and put it on the Reagan field. We have to approach it the same way and change just the center of gravity of our politics. As a black male educator, I'm often praised for my work outside of discipline, even by my supervising assistant principal credited to my approach. I seldom have discipline issues. Why are black males often seen tasks with leading discipline efforts? Why are we often having to do disciplinary yeah, stuff? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, get it. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, you know, that's a great question. We're often asked to do so much over and beyond what what we're supposed to be doing in the classroom. And well, and I guess a little bit of it is too. Why would a, a why if a black male teacher can have so little discipline? You know, and we're seeing so many discipline issues broadly. Is perhaps again, it's back to the first question of the diversity of the teaching core. Yeah, and, and then there's Empathy. kind of presumptions that you know you need a father figure in, in 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 the lives of these students, and the absence of the presumption of the absence of fathers mean uh, means that um, they are unruly and un, you know and in need of discipline. So. We often look to play that role in the lives of our students. And that assumption may be problematic in a number of different ways that we don't have time to unpack. How do we balance between teaching kids to be affirmed in who they are, very authentic, while also preparing them to navigate the world we're preparing them to be a part of? <laughs> yeah, it's so hard. That's, that's the question, right? Excellence. You know, you don't teach. There's a moment in James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time when Baldwin says something to his stepfather which lets his stepfather know that he doesn't understand that he's a black man in the United States. So his stepfather responds with violence. Pow! 
slaps him. Great. And he slaps him because he's trying to protect him. It's an odd formulation, yes? Because if you walk out in the world thinking that, you're going to get lynched. So oftentimes, right, that kind of response, right, leads us to quiet ourselves, to mute ourselves. One of the things I've been trying to teach my son, and I want y'all to, y'all tell me what you think about this. He's now 25, 26 years old. I said, the world conspires to make you small. The question is whether or not you're going to be complicit. Now, I've already told him in that formulation what the world conspires to do. So I'm not telling him to be naive. Right. But the question is whether you're going to be complicit. I have to ask myself that question all the time. Do I mute myself to make you feel uncomfortable? To make you feel comfortable? Do I quiet my particularity? Is the condition for my entree into your room that I leave the particularity of who I am at the door? Do I comply or do I bring my full self into the room? And you have to adjust. I want to teach that to my baby from. Makes sense, totally. I've seen a little bit of that for women too. Exactly. <laughs> and I'll do, okay. All right, Rachel, you ready? Before we get the, I know, you're, you, I know you guys have this. five more minutes and I know we have a mission here to get to the moon. So, um, look at that. Like okay, one more. So this is really actually around the, the question of what you say to white people um, who may have, is this is phrased, an unconscious or conscious existential crisis when confronted with, and this is about speaking you know, candidly about race really, with, with acknowledging and repairing deep racial injustices those that fear shifting you know, power structures. How, you know, how do you, I, mean, I think yeah. it's a conversation a lot of us are having, so. So I think it's, it's a couple of things really quickly, because I see Rachel over there looming. Um, a couple of things really quickly. First of all, I think everyone should read Wendell Berry's The Hidden Wound. It's a wonderful little book written by this Kentucky white boy, right, about how he has been grappling with his own racism that he learned like language at his mother's knee. It's a beautiful little book that's at the heart of my book, De um, A Democracy in Black. So the first thing, the se so the first thing is to su suggest Barry's book. The second thing is, there's this distinction that James Baldwin makes in The Evidence of Things Not Seen. He says, I happen to love a lot of people who happen to be white, and then they're white people. <laughs> Choose. Make your choice. Which side of that ledger do you want to be on? And then get clear, last point, third point, get clear on your conceptions of justice. I'm asked as I walk around, travel around the country, what can I do, what can I, and the first thing I say is get clear about your conception of justice. If you believe that every child should be educated, no matter the color of their skin or their zip code, then you should be supporting JPEF. You should be supporting the education of all of our kids but we always have these exceptions. If you believe that everyone should be treated equally under the law, then act on it. You're supposed to be fighting for criminal justice reform, police reform, but you have exceptions. If you believe that no one should go broke because they get sick, then fight for a healthcare system that what is your conception of justice and deal with the exceptions that allow you to be complicit with the injustice around you. And that's why I love the value gap framework. So thank you so much, Dr. Cloud. This is fantastic, and I'll let Rachel finish it up. Thank you, thank you so much. I just have to say I am so full, and it is not just because my lunch was good. So I, I hope you all are feeling as full as I am right now. I am so grateful. Thank you so much, Dr. Gloud. We appreciate you so much for being in Jacksonville and for taking this time to inspire us all. We really, really appreciate it. Please give Dr. Gloud another round of applause. And thank you so much, Deborah. I'm so grateful that um, you took time out of your busy schedule to be here with us, traveling also again to Jacksonville for this moment. Um, 
and the support we've received. Thank you all so much. Um, I hope it's clear that this is the beginning of a new chapter of work and the fact that you all are locking hands with us in these efforts means the world to me. It means the world to our entire team, to the entirety of the Jacksonville Public Education Fund family. There are so many incredible partners in this room who we are so excited to work with as we seek to really make the difference that's required to um, really move the needle for our students. So I want to thank you all so much for that. I have to say a very special thank you to the JPEF team uh, who worked so hard. They've been here since 7.30 a.m. to make sure we we're prepared for this. And she definitely didn't know I was going to do this, but a very special shout out to Veronica Session Fennell, who you probably heard from via email. Uh, but she worked incredibly hard to make sure all of the finishing touches on Ed Talks um, were brought to fruition. Um, for those of us joining online, thank you so much for joining us for Ed Talks as well. For those of you partners who are joining us for Ed Talks Plus Action, please meet us in the St. John's room on the third floor by 125, and we'll begin promptly at 1.30 for that particular meeting and confirmed advisor, speaker, gold and silver sponsor representatives, join us in board room four. We thank you all so much again. Let's make history together. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.